Thank you, Mikhail, for sharing that with us. That takes a lot of courage to share things like that, and I think it does us well sometimes to just pause and reflect on the power of God in people's lives. One of the dangers I reckon that we have is that we don't remember those things enough. Sometimes time, time goes on, and I dare say while most of you are listening to that very personal story, we're probably reflecting things in your life that maybe you'd even forgotten of where God had made, had a powerful influence and miracles are being performed. And I look back and I say, it's just too easy to forget those things. And I think it's good that we just spend time reflecting and just seeing how good God is. So thank you for your courage in doing that. It's not always easy sharing something as personal as that. But I think all of us draw strength from each other. And I think it helps us all in our Christian walk to do that. So thank you so much. Just want to share with you today. It's great to be here. I know when... Um, Kathy walked in, my wife, she said, isn't it exciting I see this on TV? <laughs> you know when you've been to those places and you see it in real life? Well, it's one, it was one of those moments. And I think it's a great thing what you're doing in um, um, sharing that because periodically, <coughs> Kathy more regularly, um, we do watch what's happening here each week and it's actually really good. You feel the connection because having our kids here, you feel that connection of seeing what they're doing on a Sabbath rather than maybe knowing about it and um, I know our daughter Sharon who's been here occasionally she's she's doing it she sent me a little text before she said she's tuned in today so that's one viewer you got at least isn't it you know <laughs> and um, but no it's, it is it is a very good thing and I I think it's great they're online because you never know how people are searching do you and people are searching for something and it only just needs that one thing sometimes a little bit about myself I'm as Roy said I'm the father and father of the father-in-law of these two here which we're very proud of them. But I live um, just north of Sydney and Central Coast around the Gosford area. And I've got a few pictures to show some of the things I have to put up with in that area. Terrible. So you just know a little bit about me and the setting where I, where I am. So for our recreation, not so much this year. I damaged my shoulder and then it's got cold. Um, Kathy and I, we often will be kayaking around the waters. We're just a few minutes from our home as the water's around Brisbane water on the central coast and we go kayaking and exploring all those areas together so we get to enjoy that de-stressing of life. You're busy at work, you come home and you think it's great out in nature, just feels great. So we're very blessed that we're able to do that. What I've started doing in the... It's not... Oh, it's, oh that always will help. That will help. Yeah, that will help. And what I've started doing in the last couple of years with some friends with church is in the bush around near us is going riding our bikes in the bush and bashing around on that. And that's good fun too. can recommend it except when you fall off. And I did that quite badly earlier in the year and damaged, <laughs> damaged my shoulder, but you get back on and you ride again. So you've got to have an outlet to do something, don't you? And if you can do something out in God's nature, just so much the better. So where I am, I am really blessed. And um, some of you may know some of that around those areas um, with it. So, so yeah, so a little bit about myself, and I know some of you here, which is good. And, and David, who's behind you, just and the last time I saw him was in the US just a few weeks ago. And I work with David's mother at the South Pacific Division office, which is in Morunga. Probably some of you may know where that is, just opposite Sydney Adventist Hospital. And just to give you a little bit about the South Pacific Division and what I do there, this little map there is a map of the territories that make up the South Pacific Division and all our churches and schools and operations there, like Sanitarium, Health Food Company, things like that, all come under that umbrella. So it's quite a big, diverse area of water. I'm the Chief Financial Officer for that area of all the finances, so I have to keep a bit of an eye on that stuff and the legal side of it as well. Um, I have to work on things like Sydney I, on the border um, sanitarium, um, those well-known things the church does, Avondale College, things like that. So we get a fair oversight as to how the church operates within this division and around the world. And I'm very privileged because I get that rare insight into how the church is doing everywhere. I see what's happening in a church here and what that means as we extend further afield as the church's activities and sometimes we forget the ministries that are being performed in many different ways. We've just had our general conference session and it's interesting just as a church just share one or two facts with you um, and it's interesting when you see the whole world come together for that and some of us were here there was one two three four five of us were there now that's not bad proportion out of a church congregation to be a general conference session 
where there's about 60, 70,000 people out of all the world. So your odds are pretty good out of this church today as a representation there. But it was a great time of reflection in the US where the church did, does its five yearly cycle. And it's really exciting when you look at the growth rates of the church and how it is going membership wise over the history. When you look from 1962, <laughs> And going through to 2010, I didn't have a later one there, but it's up about about there when you go through to the 2015. Um, if you're a company, wouldn't you like a growth, growth, growth line like that? Very healthy, isn't it? So we can be very pleased that we're on a very healthy church as the way it's going. What that means for membership growth, if that was your share portfolio, you'd be very excited, wouldn't you? Well, this is the membership of the church, which is... The church's share portfolio is its membership. So you see just how well we are doing church-wise. There's a lot to be excited about as we look worldwide. My particular area of focus, I'll just sh share with you quickly. I'm going to talk a little bit later about tithe, but I'll just share two things with you at the beginning. A lot of us don't understand often how tithe is used, and we'll talk a little bit about the giving of it. But I'll just share with you basically that when we look at a worldwide church, tithe is something when we share in our offerings each week, that actually ripples all through the world church. Many people don't understand that, that the systematic way we've got of giving is so simple that when money is returned to tithe in the local church, it affects the whole world, not just the area. And the reason for that is that we learned from experience in our world, in our church history over the last hundred years that we needed to share. The church in its early days before 1900 almost went broke through the lack of a system. Some churches were doing well, some weren't. We said we need to share to impact the world globally. So what happens with tithe is 80% of it stays within the conference for ministry within that conference. 8% um, stays within the union, which helps the work of the church across Australia, and that's the shared things a church may do across Australia. 10% goes to the division, and a lot of the division does is working in helping our Pacific neighbours and our Pacific missions where they don't have as much resources, so it helps that. Uh, things like our media network all are done. And then we share 2% of that with the World Church, which helps for places like the 1040 window. So often when we say, oh, the little box up the back for your tithe, we don't often understand just how organised that actually is. It looks simple but it's very, very effective in its reach and around the world and how it is there. So it's interesting for us just to see what kind of a system we do have in place. I'll skip over that one there for that. But that's just our tithe growth in Australia. Again, that's the Australian CPI, which is your wage increases. Look at the tithe, the increase in tithe. And that shows me that the church in Australia is very healthy. It's a very interesting thing. Another graph that I was tempted to share, but I wouldn't I decided not to because I don't have enough time. But in the last couple of years, we've introduced all these e-giving type options. I don't know if any of you got using the e-giving app on the iPhone or Android. It's really interesting now that $1 in 7 of tithe is now coming through those electronic areas. That's pretty, pretty good when you look at taking a lot of the factors. And the peak day, what do you think the peak day is for tithe coming and being paid? Pun? Friday, Thursday. Thursday is the peak day as far as that. On the electronic, the, the, um, that's on the website. On the mobile apps, what do you think the peak day is? Sabbath. And what time? Between 10 and 12. It just goes up on a graph like that. So you can see that those boxes have begun to become pretty outdated. It's pretty outdated. We're moving into a different era. So if you haven't got the e-giving app, use it. Let your friends know because it is very, very convenient and a good way to, to deal with it. But I want to talk a little bit about finance, a little bit about decisions today as I've been asked to give that bit of a bit of a focus and to share a few things with you since finance is my area that I sort of live in a little bit. What I want to share with you by way of beginning is a, is a little bit out of, out of Matthew. I know you're studying Matthew at the moment. So it's an important book. It's easy. It's the first first book in the New Testament. So if you can't find Matthew, just go somewhere about two-thirds into the book and you always will find it. But as we look at Matthew, there's a couple of things I want to just share with you out of Matthew. But first in looking at it, I want to look today a little bit about choices. Just think a little bit about choices. And today we are always making choices, but sometimes we don't always make the right choices, do we? 
what influences our choices? What do you think does it? We're sort of in a world that's very materialistic, one that's driving us basically every day. We're being, when we watch television or radio, someone's trying to get us to make a choice, aren't they? Buy this, do this, go there. So we're really being moulded by choices. And how do we work out what choices are the right ones to do? Because when we look in the example of people in the Bible, some of them made some really good choices, didn't they? But a lot made some really dumb choices that we look back on them and say, how could someone be so thick? Do you ever think that when you read the Bible? How could someone be so thick? Fortunately, we, we've got the benefit of hindsight. But when you're looking forward, you use the facts and information available today to make you, your choice going forward. When you look at um, Jacob and gaining trust from Isaac, remember the deception that happened there in the tent and then put up on the hairy arms and everything like that? Do you ever think how dumb he was? to get deceived and not knowing his own son. One of the dangers is, though, why don't you put a little bit of hair on him? So there's a little, little bit of hair, voice not quite right, so I thought, that's what I'll do. And the big danger we have today is that we get a little bit of truth mixed with a little bit of fiction, and then it starts to feel maybe that's the right way to do. And that's really what we need to be thinking about when we study Scripture to say, what are we looking at? What are we studying? How does that influence our decisions when we look at particular um, pieces of information? I always find it interesting when I look at facts, because I'm an accountant. I like looking at facts and I like analysing things and then working out what's right and wrong. It's just my vocation, so that's the way I do things. One of the amazing facts that I found is that we had... Um, uh, November, November 11, just yesterday, wasn't it? And that went September 11. Oh, getting wrong. Um, September. You know what I mean. The World Trade Tower Center. We had that. That was a big event in the life of this world in our time, wasn't it? Will there be another thing as big in our time? Who knows? Possibly not. Possibly. But the media really played on that. Maybe they played on it for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. And it did change people's behaviours, didn't it? It did change people's behaviours. People were afraid to fly. Remember that? They drove cars and they went everywhere. They knew that planes suddenly were dangerous. They could fly into buildings or they could fly into that. What I found interesting is that when I saw after that, they went and studied how many people extra died on the roads as a result of using cars instead of aeroplanes. Do you know more people died in car accident, extra increase in car accidents than died in the World Trade Tower Centre? The behaviours changed because we thought it would be more it'd be safer in the car, so we went to the car instead. So we used our emotions to make the decisions rather than the facts. And that's the outcome. It's interesting when you study those things. In fact, one of the figures that came out of it, here's a fact for you to think about. If a to compare it. If a plane a week in the US was hijacked and all killed, the chances of being killed in a year is 1 in 135,000. But you imagine if a plane a week was hijacked in the US and everyone was killed, would we use aeroplanes? The chance is 1 in 135,000 compared to a car of 1 in 6,000. So you'd still be safer in the car. Because it'd be one hundred and thirty-five of still in a plane, one in six thousand of a car. So still twenty times more risky to get in a car than a plane. The attitude behind it is that we like to think we're in control. If we're in control, it must be okay because I can do it. As opposed to a plane where I've got to submit to the pilot and hope he gets me there. We like to be in charge. And that's the thing what I want you to look at a little bit and think about that as I'm going to give you two illustrations this morning, okay, or this afternoon. If you can turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 9, I'll just quickly look a little bit there, Matthew chapter 9 and verse 9.
Matthew 9, verse 9, I'll just read it for you. It says, As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told me. And Matthew got up and followed him. Did that make any sense? Jesus walked along and told him, follow me. He got up and left. Was that a rational decision? Was there any calculation? Did he follow his heart or did he follow his head? And particularly when you look at Matthew's lot in life, there wasn't a lot of second chances for him because he was a tax collector. He was hated. He was despised. The Romans didn't like him and the Jews thought they were a traitor. They diddled everybody, so he really didn't have any friends probably except fellow tax collectors. So for him to walk out on being a tax collector and follow Jesus, what was his plan B? Was there a plan B? No. So he just got up and left. And Jesus obviously knew there was something there that he tapped into because it doesn't seem to be a lot of dialogue. It wasn't sort of what's the pay and for how long's the contract and what am I going to do? He just said, OK, I'll go. Obviously, he must have seen a little bit to know that this was something that was worth pursuing. In contrast, I want you to turn now in Matthew 19 and verse 16. We don't often think a lot about Matthew and his response. Matthew wrote this book. We say very little about his response to that. The next one in Matthew 19, we dwell a lot on. When we're talking there about the rich young ruler, we talk a lot on this one, on the decision he's got. You can turn in your Bibles to Matthew 19 and verse 16. And we'll read and look at that there. I'll just read a few verses there to you. And it says there, Matthew 19, verse 16. Now a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied, There is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, obey the commandments. Which ones? The man inquired. Jesus replied, Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Honour your father and mother and love your neighbour as yourself. All those I have kept, the young man said. What do I still lack? Jesus answered, If you want to be perfect, go. Sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. Then the young man heard this. He went away and said, it was sad because he had great wealth. Then Jesus said to his disciples, I tell you the truth, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Same sort of a calling, wasn't it? Just follow me. Both were probably very wealthy men. Matthew, probably as a tax collector, was probably a wealthy person. He went on impulse and walked away. And you can see with the rich young ruler, he struggled. And for him... He could have had a plan B because he would have had friends, he had money, he would have been well liked, he'd probably been a good boy who'd been obeying the law. So he had a plan B. But you see his response to Jesus was, I can't make that decision, I can't step away. Why? Because he put his security in the things that he had. He put his security in the things that he had. And it's those two choices that I see as contrasting choices that really are at some of the heart of our Christian experience and response to God in those two people. Both probably fairly well off. One couldn't have had a plan B, one could have. Which one was putting their security in what they had and the decisions they made? And that really affects us because we, when we look about what is our response to God is very very similar what is our response to God when he asks us to do things and Roy in his introduction talks about stewardship and I don't actually think I like to use that word stewardship because it all comes with all sorts of connotations it always has seemed like it's a fundraising or it's something like that we're trying to raise money for that that's not what stewardship or our response to God is about at all and I'll explain a little bit about that. should have nothing to do with it as far as fundraising. Stewardship is about our response. That's our, and that's a personal thing. It's not a group thing. It's a personal thing. So I'll just share and we'll just go over a few things today just to explain that. And hopefully we'll have it simple. We don't have a lot of time to go into a lot of things. So we'll just share a few things today. Okay. This is really key. And if so, someone could look up for me, and I want you to, someone to read for me, Proverbs 3, verse 5 to 10. 
what we're being called to do is to put God first. When Matthew was being called, what was he being asked to do? Put God first. When the rich young ruler, what was he being asked to do? He thought he did all the things around God, keeping commandments, but it really came to the acid test, was he putting God first? That's what we're asked to do. Are we prepared to put God first? Can someone read for me those couple of verses, please? Proverbs 3, verses 5 to 10. Okay, see so what's been there? Trust in God, put God first, honour him with our possessions and we will be blessed. And we'll be blessed in many ways. We should never look upon our blessings as material things. We are blessed in other ways. The biggest blessing we can receive is eternal life. If that's a relationship there, it's worth more than any riches that people would have. And I don't look at it like it. But when we look at our financial aspects to do with God that is sometimes for many people some of the hardest things that we actually have to respond to God with because it's the one where we struggle the most it's the one where we struggle the most and it's one that was often used as a test like with a rich young ruler that's a test other people are tested in other areas God knows where our spots are as far as where that goes but our financial ones become one where we can actually tangibly say what is our response to God on it what should be our motivations for giving? Our motivation to giving to God should be worship. It should be worship. It should be honouring him as God as first. We should be integrating God into every part of our life. If he's part of our life, then we will want to respond. We want to show thanks to God. When we look at our tithes and offerings, I look at it as two things. We shouldn't view returning to God something like a tax or something we must do as soon as that happens God really doesn't want our offerings at that point and I don't want it to be seen today to be saying anything to sort of, sort of have people saying you must give tithes and offerings because I don't think that's I don't think that is the way that we should be saying things but we need to be aware of our own Christian experience and some of us on a journey and all different stages around it so I don't want to be there saying that you must do this to do this or to get this not at all I just want us to study and to look and say what is the motivation for giving and, and tithes and offerings and everyone will be on a different stage with it I likened it as I was preparing for this and thinking well we how many of us like paying taxes like we've just had June 30 come up how many of us really like paying that tax do we begrudge it or do you think when you get to the end of it and say, look, round it up another hundred bucks. Do we ever say that? We get more excited about getting $60 back than getting, giving an extra hundred. I've never heard anyone saying, I want to give more. When it comes, because it's mandatory. It's something you must do. You have no choice in it, and that's the relationship we have. In contrast, when we look here today, if I told everybody that this year you've got a really good pastor in in Roy here okay everyone agree with that you got a really good pastor there if I said to show your appreciation this year I want everybody here to buy him a $500 present to Christmas for Christmas to show him how much you appreciate him and you never want him to leave okay so $500 this year how many people would be happy to do that this is a test Roy close your eyes you know <laughs> how many people would actually do that and say yep I'm into it if I got up here and commanded that. No one's put their hand up, Roy, sorry. Don't take it personally. They're probably just embarrassed. I probably set the figure too low. They might have been thinking of being devaluing you. They only spent a thousand. And I'll tell you, there are some churches in the Pacific, in, I'll just give you the silo, in Samoa, once a year they take up an offering for their pastor to show of appreciation. And some of the biggest offerings in the year, they say, there's a gift to show you our appreciation. Different culture. Probably not good for this culture, for that culture. However, this Christmas, I dare say Jinha has no qualms about buying Roy a present. Would that be right? 
no qualms at all. And she probably would like to get the best gift she could, okay? The same with our spouses and family. It's no effort to do and respond to people. And that should be our motivation for giving. <coughs> it shouldn't be something we have to do, we feel compelled to do. It's something we want to do. And that's exactly what we're talking about here when we're talking about giving and returning to God. It's something that we want to do. I don't want to ever command anyone and say, you must do this. It's something you want to do. Some people may not want to do it, and that may be reflective of their journey. But that's the way we should be looking, looking at it, and it's that response. And as we analyse that response, then we understand where we're at. I'm just going to look at these behind me over there. Tithing isn't a matter of gener generosity or gratitude. It's a matter of honesty with God. What's it command us in Leviticus 27.30? It says, All the tithe of the land is the Lord's, and it is holy to the Lord. Okay. Two things in that when we see tithing giving in the early stages of the New Testament. What's we, what are we saying there? What, what's it say tithe is? Holy. How many things in the Bible are actually described as holy? Just think about it. How many things in the Bible are described as holy and what our response to those things is? Sabbath is described as holy. It's treated as very, very sacred. Remember the ark was holy. And the way that people safeguarded the Israelites was holy. Here we see again, tithe is said, this is holy. We have the attitude sometimes that we're returning tithe to God, we're giving some of our possessions, but there's, how much does the world does God actually own? All of it. We divide up the land and say, I've got title to this 500 square metres if we're lucky. Um, I own the car and it's registered in my name. And we've got the idea in our consumers going, this is mine. This is mine. But really, when it comes to this world, how much of this world do we really own? What's really ours compared to what God has? And, this is, and tithe is about acknowledging that really everything comes from God. When we die, it all reverts. Nothing very little is permanent within the land. It's just all there and God owns it. So we need to tithe as a way when you are serving and honouring God that the returning of it acknowledges him as the owner and everything we have is a blessing. We get to keep 90% of his. That's what's talking about in that there. It's not that we're being generous in giving something to God. We're just saying to God, thank you. Thank you. And tithe, we take that for granted often, but tithe is a tenth of our income. What we're being said is a tenth of our income. And I find that a, an easy figure as an accountant. Didn't have to calculate 10%, just move the decimal point, don't you? Something we're taught in school. And um, when I go to the US, I hate a tenth. I find it really hard. Because they say in Australia, you can get away with 10% adding to a restaurant bill. I round it down, you know? I hate it. Um, but a tenth when it comes to God is not tipping. Sometimes we often think, oh, we're tipping God. Some people think it's sort of, oh, well, I'll give you a tip. It's nothing like that at all. It's a very different thing that we have within it. And it's a tenth of our income that we're being asked to give. A sobering fact, I know, they did some studies on uh, numeracy in the Australian population. Did you know that less than half the population of Australia can calculate a 10% tip on a restaurant bill that's the numeracy skills it's a bit of a worry that it, we struggle with ca calculating a tenth of a cent but I believe everyone in this room knows how to calculate 10% so it's okay otherwise I would have gone into a little math lesson to explain to you how to calculate one tenth because it is a challenging number for nearly half the population of Australia believe it or not but that's what God has um, outlined in there. So he's, he's saying, return a tenth to me to show you the, the gratitude as an act of worship in the tithe. What should we do with tithe? If we've got tithe, we say it and God says, I'd like you to return a tenth to me to honour me as creator and show our response of love. It is really like a love offering. We should bring it to the storehouse, which means that that was what was then taken to... Um, 
share with the Israelites because the Levites were the ones that were determined to benefit from the tithe, which was the, the, what is really the ministry today. They were the priests of that tribe. They didn't work, but they were then given that tithe for which to support on it. We do the same today. We return our tithe. We don't just get it in our local congregation to buy a PA system or something like that. We return it and it goes to the conference who then uses that to pay our ministry and other expenses here and in wider way. So we're doing the same principles that this is the way that we can then partner with our tithe in our ministry going forward. So as a church, that's the way we run it, through our conference and ministers receive their salaries. And we are very, very fortunate that across our division, we've got a very, very faithful membership. And I say one of the ways that we can actually measure the health of the church is by seeing the faithfulness of people returning tithes and offerings. Because you can't force people to return tithes and offerings. And we don't. But we see the response of people who want to return their tithes and offerings. And we see that coming in <coughs> week by week. And this here is how we do acknowledge God as the lordship of it, as the words that are there. I'll just read that for you. The tithe is a tool God uses to establish his lordship in our lives. The way we deal with money, more specifically tithe, is a reflection of where God is in our lives. And that's where, with the rich young ruler, God knew what was stopping him. He knew what was stopping him and he targeted it. I d Matthew obviously wasn't an issue, was it? He just left everything. But God knew it was stopping him. And it's one of the areas that we actually find the hardest as individuals sometimes to deal with the barriers. Because we actually work hard for our money, don't we? Spend long hours, pressures on us, and it's probably the hardest thing for us to often do. It's easier to do something else, but then to acknowledge week by week as God as having blessed in our lives and the blessings that we have to return to him a tithe so that ministry continue to be performed in other areas. And so we are being asked to say, are we putting God first? Simple question, are we putting God first? This is the test that is being given to us each week when God's commanded about the tithes and offerings. It's interesting that we see a lot of the positive benefits of people returning tithe. We see the allegiance. We see where people are. I really don't read much negative in the Bible as far as people who don't return tithe. So there's no big stick there to say, if you don't return tithe, the ground's going to swallow you up. But what you can read by it is, you miss out on the blessings. So God's not a God who's saying, do this or else. But he's saying, if you return tithe and it shows you where you are in the relationship with me, look at the blessings you're going to have. And we had a testimony this morning to show how God can bless us and perform miracles when we are in a partnership with him. But we should never view tithe as buying favour. It's not like a Hindu God where you know, you're caught favour and you burn something on it. It's about a relationship. This really shows about where the relationship is at. So, it's, and it's the other one too, it's not a blackmail. I think this, I like this quote, Tithe is not a 10% blackmail payment to God, so we can do what we want with the remaining 90%. Neither is a tithe as a tip to God, thanking him for what we have received. It's not a financial transaction. It's not something we say, God, I will pay tithe if... As soon as you've done that, you lost the plot. It's not about that at all. It's not about that at all. But it is about acknowledging God as our Lord and Creator. And this one here, what's that verse say? Matthew 6, 24. Can someone read that for me, please? Matthew 6, 24. I haven't got it in my notes here and I haven't got my Bible up with me. So I, have, I rely on other people to help me. Okay. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. <laughs> it is. What's it saying? And this is one we look at often because one of the most powerful forces on people is money, isn't it? And it's often tested, they'll say, would you do this for how much? Isn't that a test? And everybody, they say, has a price, don't they? 
everybody has a price. You remember a few years ago, there was a movie, probably might be actually before some of you were born, I guess. Remember they had a movie called Indecent Proposal? At what point would money be more important than the marriage relationship? That was the theme of the movie. At what point? That's where people are often tested, you know, bribing people in government because money is a powerful force. It's a powerful force on a day-to-day -day basis. And so this text is really going to the heart of almost our human nature. Can you serve two things? If you put money first, can you serve God? Money you probably win if you make that first. And so it's a challenging text when we look at, look at that. So we need to look at and say, what are the things that can take control of our life? We often look at things and we say, we watch too much TV or we do too much of this or too much for that. I don't hear many people saying, I've got too much money or money's taken over my life. We don't often talk about it like that, do we? We don't often talk about it like that. But it is a powerful force that we need to say it has a place. And there's nothing wrong with money. I'm not anti-money. In fact, God's not anti-money. You remember in the New Testament, he said, um, it's in Galatians and something, I have made you rich. Why? So you can be generous. So God's not actually abdicating poverty. What he is abdicating is loyalty and generosity. And we often get the idea when we're talking on these things that it's almost shameful to be rich or to have money. That's not at all. The issue is if money becomes more important. And we've got some really amazing people worldwide that have been tested in these areas of, of it that are really rich people. We've got some church members that are really rich, but they are extremely generous. They use that as a force for God not to control their lives in opposition to God. One of the biggest tests of faith I've seen in my time at, um, at the division as um, Chief Financial Officer is I serve on the General Conference Executive Committee, the World Executive Committee for the Church. A number of years ago, we had a businessman in the US, only happened in the US, I guess, who sold a portion of his overseas business. Only you know the one? A portion of his overseas business. And he's still got the rest of the business. And to date, he's returned over $100 million of tithe from that transaction. Now, if you want to be tested of where you are with God, try writing a cheque for $100 million. And I know our General Conference Treasurer said he's astounded because it just turned up in the mail with a cheque and all it had on it was tithe. And he said... What did the bank people think of this? Because in the US they still have the paper checks and just written down the bottom was simpler. There was no conditions, there was no hoo-ha, it was all anonymous, just faithfully returning over $100 million in tithe, just a simple way. It's amazing, isn't it? It's amazing. And the faithfulness of our membership, the way they've been blessed, and it's a, testi it's a testimony to, to that. And that's where we're saying is in that text there, which takes more control of our life? Would it be hard to write that check out? I've never been tested, fortunately. But I'd like to be. Um, the psalmist challenges us, and this is what it says in Psalms 96. It says, Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendour of his holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. This is what we're talking about there. When we return our tithes and offerings, it is an act of worship. We see as God as being number one. We want to say thank you. We love him and that is our response. It's not hard. When we go to family time at Christmas time, we all gather together, we want to give gifts and celebrate, don't we? And we all want to show how much we love each other through the tokens of that. This is what they're saying, come each week to church. Acknowledge God as our saviour. Let's be excited and celebrate and return to God what is his. It's not very complicated, and that's what the psalmist says we should be doing. It should be an attitude of gratitude. It shouldn't be one where we're saying, oh, I've got to do it. It's such a great thing that God's outlaid there. This is what was written in our early church history here by Ellen White. This is what she said, The Lord does not need our offerings. This is the only way in which it is possible for us to manifest our gratitude and love to God. He has provided no other. Have you ever thought about that? God actually doesn't need our money when you think of the miracles that can be formed he stopped the sun he's divided seas 
He actually doesn't need our money. What he does need is us. And this shows us and is returning that says we're in a relationship. That's what it's about. That's what it's about. God is all powerful. God can do everything. But God wants us in the relationship. And tithing and giving and returning of our tithes and offerings is part of that is part of that relationship. So that's how we need to be looking at our giving relationship, the choices that we're being asked to make. I want to reflect where we started when we looked at Matthew. Matthew was willing without hesitation to say, I want a relationship with God. All my possessions, I leave, I follow you. Rich young ruler wanted a, really wanted a relationship with God. Searched, was doing all the right things, wasn't he? But God knew there was one thing holding him back in really enjoying that relationship. And in fact, it almost looks like he didn't have a half-baked relationship continuing. It almost looks like he walked away, doesn't it? It was almost a drop-dead issue. You gather from that it was one of those drop-dead issues. That is similar to us today. God wants us. He wants us in a relationship. Our returning and our tithes and offerings is part of that relationship. And I want you to think about that when the choices we make in serving God and our response to him.